and welcome to this edition of the MuseScore Cafe. So this is my regular weekly series where we talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore. And I show you how to do different things, answer some questions, and see what we can learn about using MuseScore. So the uh, whole series is brought to you by the Mastery MuseScore School, and I have the link pinned at the top of the chat, so please uh, check it out if you haven't already. Check out all my online courses that I offer for learning MuseScore and learning about music. So, uh, what I want to do today is first welcome everyone who's here. I know we have some new people because this is sort of a, a special, unusual uh, subject for me to be talking about. And... Um, uh, and hopefully we'll discover some things. It's a discovery process for me too, to be honest. And so the topic that I've chosen to talk about is uh, film music, creating film music. And this is, as I've, I disclaimer, it is not something I have a lot of experience with, um, but I've been exploring the techniques and wanted to share with you and anyone who does have uh, experience with this, who wants to join in in the chat and uh, give us uh, your uh, input and feedback and maybe give me some ideas of things to try. Uh, go ahead. So what I want to do here is uh, I, I in my newsletter, hopefully you all are subscribed to my newsletter. And in the newsletter, I gave you some links to some software that is very useful um, in doing film score type work. It's not absolutely necessary that you do all of this. Um, but uh, it's useful. So what I'm going to do is start up some of that software so we can see what's going on. So right now I have MuseScore loaded, right? Um, and obviously that's what I'm going to be using for uh, um, you know most of what I'm doing here. But in order to actually synchronize the music with video. This is one of the key things that we're going to want to see happen. So there's a program called XJDO. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it, but uh, it's spelt like this, X-J-A-D-E-O. In my newsletter, I give the link to it or just do a web search for it. So when I load XJDO, I see this window and it's very small on my system. So the first thing I want to do is increase the size of it, um, the fonts and all. So now what I can do is load a video. And as it tells me, right click is how you access things. And there's the file menu and there's open menu. Did I really, is that really 150%? I feel like I missed. Yeah, I guess it is. Oh, well, control O to open a file. And I have created a video that is the world's least interesting video, um, but it's going to be what we're going to use here. And it's going to be this guy right here that says video for music. And it loads the video and um, we see the model, uh, namely me, or uh, the actor. Uh, there's, it's just me talking and wandering around doing aimless things. If I play the video from here, I, I can do that. Nothing much interesting happens. Uh, I think, actually I have to, I can't even start it yet, so never mind. Um, this video though, I want to be synchronized to the music. So there's a tool that will do that. And the JA part of XJDO, uh, the JA part comes from the word Jack, uh, which is, I don't know if it's an acronym or not, but it's another program that you install on your program, that hand, on your computer, that handles synchronization between different programs. So I've installed Jack, and when I install Jack, there's a program called Q jack control q jack ctl on windows i think it's just called jack control um, but it's um it's the same basic program and when you start this program it will then kind of set up jack for you and do some other useful things so it's just a little small window here and i'm going to press the start button when i press the start button it does some stuff and every once in a while just completely fails. Um, and that's annoying. And I don't know enough about this. So I, I see these errors about unable to connect the thing and I have no idea why that happens. So what I do know is if that happens, I can close all this stuff down 
and uh, try again because I know that that happens and I'm not going to panic about it. Um, I might have to restart my Linux system to get it to work, but nope, looks like it started. Okay, so starting Jack first before other programs might be a useful thing. I don't know that that's supposed to be necessary, but it does seem to help. So now I will again start XJDO. I will again tell it to display at 150%, so I have some chance of reading it. Uh, and that's just because of my display is a high resolution display and some programs just don't know how to size themselves right. And now I will open and go to my videos folder and Come on, go to videos folder. And video for music. Okay, now I have my video loaded. Now let's bring MuseScore back into the picture. So when MuseScore um, plays music, normally it uses its own internal synthesizer. And so like if I put in some notes, uh, let me close that, put in some notes. Do you hear anything? I don't hear anything, um, but that's okay because I don't need to hear anything. Thing I'm going to not be using the internal synthesizer is is the point that I'm making. Uh, right now, the internal synthesizer I previously disabled because uh, I want to use Jack. So uh, I'm going to switch to the Jack server here, and I'm going to check all these boxes here. So now, when MuseScore plays music, it is not going to just be playing it within MuseScore. It's going to be sending information out to Jack, and Jack is going to handle synchronizing what MuseScore does with what other programs do. So if all is well, when I do this, I'm still not going to hear anything because I haven't hooked up any, uh, I haven't hooked up anything yet. Let me actually hit that reset preferences. Uh, no, not, no, sorry, not that one. Reset audio and MIDI devices. Um, I might have to restart MuseScore. Sometimes you have to do that after switching to Jack. So I'm actually not sure why I'm even hearing anything right now. I really shouldn't be any hearing anything while I'm using Jack, um, but I'm not gonna worry about that either. I'm just gonna go on. Um, what I'm going to do, let me see if I press play here, does anything happen? No, nothing happens. Um, I need to set up my synthesizer. So the third program that I told you all about in my newsletter is called QSynth. And QSynth is, uh, it's basically a window that gives you a something that looks kind of like a synthesizer window. Uh, I mean, if you've ever used an actual physical synthesizer, it's got keys on it, but then it's got other controls, right? These are the other controls. So there's some setup you need to do in order to use QSynth. If you hit the setup button, um, you'll find that you'll want to make sure the MIDI is set to use Jack. And that means when MuseScore plays music, it's going to go out through MIDI, Jack, and into QSynth. And so QSynth is going to receive the sounds that uh, MuseScore plays. You will also have to go to the sound fonts tab here and say uh, and and select one. So I've just selected the default one there, but if you say open here, you'll see it comes with a few different sound fonts and you can also use the one that came with MuseScore, you can install that. So um, yes, you don't hear Jack, this is absolutely true. There's nothing to hear yet, um, but there's hopefully about to be, and if not, I might just have to go through this process one more time, but we'll find out in a moment if this is gonna work. So, uh, we're almost ready, but we're not quite ready. Um, I am going to close MuseScore and restart it just because I feel like, um, yeah, there's no music to be heard yet. I haven't hooked everything up yet. There's a lot of setup you have to do to make this all happen. But I am going to try uh, starting MuseScore again because uh, after making sure that Jack was selected, sometimes you have to do that again. 
So the thing is, MuseScore is sitting here saying, I'm putting music out there, waiting for someone to listen to it. QSynth is sitting here saying, hey, I'm here, ready to listen to some music from Jack. But Jack's job then is to say who should talk to who. So MuseScore is putting stuff out there, and QSynth is listening to stuff, but they're not talking to each other. So we're going to have to use that QJack control program to make that happen. I'm actually going to load, uh, I'll load Reunion so we can uh, maybe hear that. So if I go back to preferences, and actually let me start my, um, where's my terminal window? I've got too many windows open. None of those are terminal windows. Look at that. I didn't open a terminal window. Seriously? I guess I closed it at one point. Um, term, and I want to open my terminal window so that I can run my key keystroke thing so you can see what I'm typing. All right. If I now go to the preferences menu and check IO again, I, I just want to make sure Jack is still selected. Everything's good. Everything's good. If I play now, I think the cursor is going to move, but we're still not going to hear anything. The fact that the cursor is not moving is definitely a little bothersome to me. Um, I feel like it should be moving, and this is potentially a problem. Uh, so I'm going to hit this restart audio and MIDI devices yet again. So the one thing that you are seeing from this is there's a lot to go wrong, a lot to fiddle with. And uh, so I'm still not sure why it's not playing, but I'm still not panicked. I am at least going to show you how to hook these things up, and if it doesn't work, then I uh, just try that whole setup again, and then you get to see it again. And this time I won't have to talk through as much of it. So this program here, this is that QJack control program. This is the program that says which program should talk to which, and I want to tell it, I want MuseScore to talk to QSynth. In this version, this is Linux that I'm on, in the Linux version of this that I have installed, there's a button here that says Graph. On Windows, I've noticed that there's a button that says Connect. I think it's an older version of the program. Um, but in any case, uh, you can see here, ooh, MuseScore is just not even showing up in here. So that tells me that MuseScore um, uh, is not correctly set up still. Um, and that's and that's part part of why things are going wrong. And I'm not sure why that is, but I'm going to try to fix it. But in any case, what's going to happen here is we are eventually going to connect the dots. We're going to draw a line from MuseScore to this one that says Fluid Synth MIDI. So that's what we're going to do once we sort out why MuseScore is misbehaving so badly. So I'm going to try to go back to my regular uh, setup here. And if this doesn't work, I'm just going to restart my Linux system. It won't require me to uh, won't require me to uh, stop the stream or anything. All will be well. But um, I just might have to uh, restart my Linux system to get the sound to work right. I don't know. We'll find out. So now I think the sound's going to work. So I don't hear anything, right? So what I'm going to do is still not panic. <laughs> that is my um, my motto here. And I'm just going to close all these things down because it didn't work, right? So uh, I'm now going to redo it, and I'm redo it in the proper order, and we'll see uh, if it works any better next time. So close all of these things down. Now... I need to restart my terminal. This part you don't need to ever know about, but this is like a, a, a thing about how Linux works on my machine. I want to shut down Linux and then restart it. Okay, so now I'm going to restart. So, as mentioned, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes on here, a lot of moving parts. We have Jack. We, well, we have MuseScore, of course. We have Jack that's going to connect things. We have QJack Control, which is the kind of user interface for Jack. We have XJDO, which is going to display our video. And we have QSynth, which is going to play the sound for us. So all of these parts have to communicate. And um, it's a lot to, uh, to 
uh, juggle. So as for why I'm using Linux, it's because I like it better in general. Actually, I don't love Linux that much. I, this is a Chromebook I'm on, and that's why I had to shut down Linux and start it, because I'm actually on a Chromebook. That's my favorite system. It's nice, simple, lightweight, does what I need, and I can run Linux apps within it. To me, it is the most comfortable system for me to work on in general, and I like the particular Chromebook that I have a lot. I do have a Windows system, but I fight it more. Mac OS, I've never gotten past the fact that I I can't just tap on the touchpad to click things. I, I can't even get started on Mac OS because I, I can't tolerate physically clicking a touchpad. So I've never even got past uh, first base. I've never even got out of the batter's box with, uh, with a Mac. Um, that's my own bias. Um, and maybe there's some way to do it, but it just hasn't interested me enough. So now that I've got things kind of started up here, I am going to uh, start MuseScore first and make sure I get some sound here. So Marcus is saying to start first, Jack, then QSynth, and then MuseScore. I'm going to start MuseScore first, make sure I have sound, then shut it down again. My experience with Linux, well, with Unix in general, Linux is just a particular flavor of Unix. It predates my experience with Windows. Um, so if I... Load a score here. So for some reason, now MuseScore is at least working properly, right? So now I can close it and try the sequence again. I'm going to start Jack first. So now this is how you would normally do things. If you wouldn't have all the technical issues, you would start the Jack controller. So I started QJack controller, and then I press the start button. And with any luck, it just works. Yay. And now Marcus is suggesting that I start QSynth next. And by gosh, uh, I'm going to do that because I haven't tried that yet. And um, so here's QSynth. And QSynth uh, takes a moment to start up and connect to Jack. And see, QSynth is now saying that it's failing to connect to uh, Jack, which is not good, right? Um, so that is not good at all. And if I'm going to have to not be able to do this, this is going to be extremely frustrating to me. Um, yeah. this I'm going to stop Jack again. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, a little miffed here. But I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm going to talk about some other issues, uh, some other things that worth that are worth knowing about, worth doing. Um, I'm going to try this again without starting MuseScore. So I'm just going to kill all this stuff again. Once more, restart Linux. And if this doesn't work, uh, we, we move on. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of technical stuff, and I played around with it a bunch over the weekend and, and got to the point where I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I see how to do this, but things can go wrong and uh, live TV, right? Um, so one of the things that I want to point out is that if you are scoring a movie, uh, it's not like, you know, if you think about a movie being like, say, two hours long, you're not writing one long two-hour piece of music. That is not typically how movie scoring works. Instead, what happens is there's a bunch of discrete little sections of music called cues. So we write these individual cues. Some of them might just be a few seconds long. Some might be several minutes long. But typically, there's music for a while, and then there's just the dialogue or whatever else is going on. Then some music comes in, some more dialogue. And of course, some of the music is behind dialogue. Some of it is not behind the dialogue. It's just background music while we're panning around and showing things, right? So the first thing that happens in movie scoring is... Uh, the film composer and the director kind of sit down together and they watch an edit of the movie. They watch, and it might not be the final cut, but it's a, a you know something that's close enough to being final that they can start thinking about the music. And they decide where they want the music. They say, hey, let's bring in some music here and let's bring it out here. And let's bring in some music here and bring it out here. That process is called spotting. I say this like I know this world, but no, I, I just, I just, you know, learned it the other day. Um, 
So I am now going to once more start. Nope, not QSynth. Dang it. Well, I'm going to try it this way anyhow, because why not? QSynth is started up. And there is no MIDI because I didn't start uh, Jack first. So let me once again start Jack. So that process of spotting is basically how you decide where you want your cues to be, which scenes are going to correspond with the music. And MuseScore, if I'm going to use MuseScore to do this and use all this stuff that I'm struggling to set up here, um, I find in my experiments, it's going to work best if I actually save, if I actually cut up the movie into those individual little chunks. In other words, if I actually make it so that um, uh, each piece of the movie that gets music is its own separate video file, I think that will be the easiest way to do this. Now, I see that this has started, but I also see that there's no numbers running here. Oh, Q is the letter Q, the letter Q. Um, and it's QT is a is a programming framework that a lot of software is written within. It's what allows software to work on both Windows and Mac OS and Linux. So a lot of software that works on all three systems involves this system called QT. MuseScore is written using QT. Uh, this QJack controller is written with that. But when I talk about so when I talk about that Q, it's the letter Q. When I talk about movie cues, it's the word. C-U-E. So a movie queue is a different thing. So when I see that this is saying started here, but these numbers aren't moving, this is bothering me because I feel like I should be seeing numbers there. Um, but I'm not seeing numbers and I'm not seeing error messages. And I guess I'm just going to have to pretend all is well. Transport say stopped. So maybe it only shows numbers here while something is playing. I didn't think that was the case, actually, but I'm going to just roll with it. All right, now I'll see if I can start QSynth and if QSynth will successfully connect to Jack this time. Nope, it doesn't. So I am uh, going to have to just give up because it's just uh, not going to work. So that's just the way it is, and it doesn't mean I'm going to give up on everything. It just means I'm going to give up on the whole synchronization business. Uh, I do want to talk about other aspects of film scoring that aren't just about all this technical gizmo stuff. I, I, I'm still not told. I say I'm going to give up, but I still want to like look at things here. What happens if I tell it not to use Jack, but tell it to use also? I know it's not going to work, but I want to see if I can then switch back to Jack and if it works. Uh, so it says it started up and then I go back to here and I'm going to switch to Jack. And audio, I feel like maybe if I set audio to Jack, maybe that'll make it better too. I, I really don't know what I'm doing here. No, no, the audio actually has to be also. I knew that. Audio has to be also. Um, but let's see if it happens to work this time. So as for MuseScore 4, yeah, this is just not going to work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's life. Um, so as for MuseScore 4, it's going to have a framework that will allow these things to become possible. The initial release of MuseScore 4 will not have any of this stuff built in, but it will have some things like support for VST instruments, if you're familiar with those, that are things that will add some add the ability to have extra realism in like orchestral music and so forth. And it will have other ways of communicating with other systems other than Jack. So um, things will be different when MuseScore 4 first comes out, but there will then be other layers of stuff added on top of that. So that's basically how it's going to work. All right. Um, so I want to talk about a couple other aspects of writing music for a uh, film. So first, let me um, just verify that I do have sound again. 
and now I don't. And it's just going to be one of those days, right? Just going to be one of those days. Um, all right, I'm going to kill all this stuff and just restart Linux one more time, this time without any of the extra gizmos and just live in MuseScore. So the thing that I want to talk about is in film scoring, there's a few things that we do differently. And I say we, like I do this. No, I don't do this. I just see other people do it. I read about it, et cetera. But there's a few things that happen differently. Um, and I want to show you those things and show you how to set these things up in your score. So let's imagine that we're writing a, a film cue and we're going to write for a whole orchestra. Because remember, John Williams was my uh, reason for doing this. And John Williams' scores are typically very orchestral, right? Not all of them. He's got some that are smaller ensembles, but a lot of the music he's most famous for are full orchestra scores and most famously really brass heavy versions, right? All the, the main themes for Star Wars and, you know, all those Jurassic Park, etc. They're all... Um, very brass heavy, but they're uh, but they're basically orchestral scores. So I'm going to create an orchestral score and then show you how to modify some things the way the film score people typically do it. And then we'll talk about why it might be relevant, why it might be important, and uh, you know you can use these you can use these techniques in non film scores also. So hopefully now I have sound. Let's find out. Yes. Okay. Um, but I, I'm not going to have all the fancy synchronization. So let's pretend we're writing a film cue. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my keyboard logger so we can see what I'm doing again. And oh, it's just really going to be one of those days when I attempted to do that. I did it too fast and MuseScore hung. And that's really going to be just one of those one of those technical gremlin days where things just don't want to behave for me. But I promise we're going to get some stuff. I've been able to talk through some things, even if you haven't been able to see it, right? Um, but yeah, I want you to be able to um, actually see some things here. So when I say that things, let's see, do we have music now? Good. So what I want to do is create a new score. So um, I press N, nope, not Control N, sorry, to create my new score. And this, I, as I said, I'm going to recommend you do this one cue at a time. So this would be the cue for the puppies running through the field scene or whatever, whatever, whatever scene it is. You're going to name the scene and have each little video go with a cue. So that way, when you work on one piece of music, you can have it synchronized to just that video. And then the next little scene that's supposed to have music can be synchronized to that piece of music. So this is going to be the puppy, puppy uh, running through field cue. And I don't know why I said that. I just I just came up with that. And so we're going to imagine that it's puppies running through a field. And now I'm going to pick an orchestral uh, thing. I'm going to go with the symphony orchestra, which is kind of the big one here. Um, and uh, I press finish here to create my score. And Kiko's asking if I can run this, turn this up a little bit. Uh, let me make sure that it's at the right volume because it should be. I think as I add more notes, it, it'll be the right volume because that that score was a quiet score, right? So um, I think uh, I, you don't want me to turn it up louder, or if I if I put in a big giant chord, it's going to be way too loud. So let's go with that. Um, so uh, so Marcus, I'm glad it worked for you, and again, it worked for me this weekend. I was having fun doing this, but. Um, for whatever reason today, it doesn't want to work. And normally I would say, oh, I'll, I'll reboot my system. But if I reboot the system, I lose the stream, not worth it. So I rebooted Linux, but I'd have to reboot my whole Chromebook to, to maybe fix it. And I don't know. I just don't know. So um, I've got my score here. So there's a couple of things that are typically done 
in movie scores. One of them, and I'm going to uh, right now hit uh, enter here just to put in a, a, a page break, a line break there. But since it's only one system per page, it's basically a page break. The default in MuseScore is to put measure numbers above the system. And that's what you see I have here. But is that going to be what we want here? And the answer is perhaps not. The thing is, in movie score, in, in, in ordinary, say, classical music, that's a typical thing to do. Just put uh, measure numbers at the start of a system. Uh, in commercial music, which basically <laughs> the distinction I would make has nothing to do with the quality of music, it, but more the... Uh, situation in which it's created. In a, in a classical orchestra score, all the people rehearse their parts, they, they have rehearsal, uh, and then, you know, it's performed straight through. It's not going to be the case that we're often going to be starting exactly from a measure 11 or exactly from measure 17. We can just have little rehearsal marks every once in a while, every 20 measures or whatever, and, and put and say, and have, here's a spot where we can all start from. But in film scoring, this is all going to be put together really quickly. Uh, when the composer finishes that music, it's going to be sent off to the studio, and studio musicians are going to record that thing the next day, probably with no rehearsal. Having rehearsal, having measure numbers everywhere is going to be kind of important. Furthermore, not everywhere. Uh, like if I if I go to format style measure numbers, you'll see. I can make them show up not every five measures, but every one measure. And now they're showing up every measure. So that's good. That's that's certainly what I want. But I don't want them showing up at the top like that because that's not the convention in this world. The convention is they're going to be below the staff. So I'm going to say I want them below. And I want them not kind of left aligned like this, where they're going to bump into bar lines and other markings, but centered. So the measure numbers centered below the staff is typically how the music is done, how measure numbers are done in film scores. So vertical placement below, horizontal placement center. Now there's another issue here, and that's right now, it's still only on the top staff. We don't want it there. We want it below the bottom staff. For various reasons, we don't yet have an option for that. We all know it's something we want eventually. Right now, we don't have an option to put measure numbers below the bottom staff only. But what we can do is say we want it on all staves. So now I have what I want. I have measure numbers below the staff, below all the staves, actually. And I'll fix that in a minute. But at least I have them where I want them, um, below the staff, centered. And because it's all staves, that means when I scroll down to the bottom, I see what I want here. So now what I want to do is deal with the fact that, and as we see, they really are centered here, that all these other measure numbers, um, I don't want to see anymore, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to select all except the uh, bottom staff. So I've just selected... I, I clicked the top staff. Let me uh, shrink, let me uh, zoom back out again. I click the first measure of the top staff. Shift click the first measure of the second to last staff. And then shift, control, end. That selects all the way to the end of the score. So now I have everything selected except the bottom staff. Now what I can do is right click one of those measure numbers, doesn't matter which one, and say select all similar elements in range selection. Now all the measure numbers in that range hopefully are selected. They're not showing up blue for me, so I'm a little worried that didn't work, but we'll find out. If I press V, they did not in fact turn invisible. So it's going to be one of those days, is it? Um, how about if I click one measure number and go to the end and shift click another. Does that select them all? No, it doesn't. 
So there is a way to do this, but I'm not correctly finding it right now. So let, let's, uh, this is one of the things that supposedly I can actually do right. So let me try again. I'm just going to select a few measures here, right click a measure number, select all similar in range selection. No. All right. Let's try it a different way. Right click one, select all similar elements. Ah, now this worked. I now have all the measure numbers selected. So you all think that I don't know anything about MuseScore because I, uh, or I don't know anything about anything because I'm having so many problems, but um, you know, this happens. This, this definitely happens. It's a question of finding, apparently, because measure numbers are sort of special things. There are a little, they can be hard to select. So I right clicked a measure number and then I said, select all similar elements. Now all the measure numbers are selected. Now what I'm gonna do is press V to make them all invisible. Now, I'm going to hope to get lucky. Now that they're all invisible, I'm going to right click the one on the bottom staff and say select all in same staff. And now, with any luck, all these ones on the bottom staff are selected, and I can press V to turn them back on. Ah, <sighs> finally, something that worked. Yes. So, that is how you can have measure numbers centered below the bottom staff. Now that whole thing I did of selecting all the measure numbers, making them invisible, you, you gotta wait to do that until you're done with the score. Cause as soon as I add new measures, I'm gonna get new measure numbers and they're not gonna be invisible. So wait to do that until you're basically, wait to do all of this business until you're closer to done with the, sto the score. To at least until you figured out how long you want the score to be, how many measures you want it to be. And here's the good thing about film scoring. You know that because you already decided in that spotting process how long this cue is going to be. You know it's going to be exactly 27 seconds long or whatever it's going to be. So you can already predict how many measures long you want it to be if you know what tempo you're going to need. So um, so yeah, add a few extra measures, do this process. And then if it distracts you to see those invisible measure numbers, well, there's a couple things we can do, but easiest is to go to view and turn off invisible things. And now I see only what I wanna see, right? So that's the process for setting up measure numbers the way you might want. The other thing that's typical in film scores is if there's going to be time signature changes, I'm going to go ahead and add a time signature change. I'm going to change to 3-4 right here. Oh, and look at that. That messed up all my hard work with the measure numbering. I was so afraid that that was going to happen. So don't do that business until you... Um, until you're ready. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna select all similar elements and I'm gonna use the inspector F8 to just make them all invisible. All my measure numbers are invisible again and then I will just turn them on when I'm ready uh, in, in the bottom staff. So uh, now that I have that three, four, I wanna show you, I'm gonna add a system break here to spread it out a little more. This idea of repeating the 3-4 on every staff, that's the traditional way for time signature changes to be notated in music. But in film scoring, for similar reasons to why they want the measure numbers on every measure, and uh, for similar reasons to make it easier during rehearsal or in lack of rehearsal to make it easier basically to get this stuff right in sight reading, Film music is typically going to have a lot of time signature changes, not because film music is necessarily weird music, but we're trying to synchronize to action in the film, and maybe it's just not at a convenient, you know, we, we have some music that's going at this pace, and then we need something to happen right here, exactly 3.2 seconds in. So we might have some music in 4-4, four, four, and then we might just have to have a random 3-4 measure so that the next thing, the next measure happens at the right time, right? We're going to do that sort of thing a lot. We're going to have a lot of changes of tempo and changes of time signature to get the right things to happen at the right time. It's not just write music however you want to write music. We're, there's all this sort of really tight timing. I want this to happen exactly when that guy drops the spoon. I want this to happen when that puppy jumps uh, over the flower because I did say it was going to be puppies and flowers, not people and spoons. But um, 
whatever, you have particular things you want to synchronize your music with, it's going to require a lot of tempo changes and probably a lot of time signature changes. So the um, this way of showing time signature, cha time signature changes is, as I mentioned, not really the norm. The norm is going to be a bit different. So I'm going to um, show you how it works. It's The norm is going to be we're going to have big numbers, not on every staff, but between the staves. Some people would only put them between some of the staves. There's your variations in how you do it, but I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. I'm going to select one of these time signatures. And notice, by the way, if I click a time signature, it looks like they're all selected, but are they all selected? That's the question. In some ways they are, in some ways they're not. So I'm going to change the scale here in the inspector. What I want to do is stretch them taller, but not wider. So I'm going to change the Y scale. And yes, they are all being affected. So great. Uh, if I make them twice as tall as they normally are, that might be fine. What I want to do now, though, is move them below the staff. So I'm going to use the Y offset here to push them down so that they're below the staff. And maybe I made them too tall, so I will scale them back. Maybe just 1.5 is as far as I want. So we can play with our distances between the staves also so that this looks the way we want, but maybe we don't actually even want it to show on all the staves. We might only want it to show like between sections. Like here, notice that MuseScore puts a little extra space between, this is here, the woodwinds, and these are the brass. It puts a little extra space there. Maybe that's the only place I want to see the time signature. Maybe I don't want to see it everywhere because maybe that makes the score too cluttered. So what we can do is right click this, the other staves and go to staff part properties and say, you know what, I don't want to see time signatures on that staff and make them go away. If you don't want it to go away like that, you could just select it and press V, but that makes them all disappear. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to control click the three, four. By control clicking it, you're selecting only one instead of the whole column. This is a thing that happens a lot in MuseScore. There's certain things where clicking, like for key signatures, or if you think about adding a key signature, if you add a key signature, it adds it to all staves at once. Of course, that's normally how music works. Same with time signatures. But if you control click, it narrows it down to only one staff at a time. So if I control click that time signature, now I can press V and hide just that one. So I, whoops, I keep doing the wrong thing here. Control V, control V, control V. Somehow, I think what's happening is I have to unselect the other one because when I, when you control click something, it adds it to the previous selection. So control click is something that, that happens not just in MuseScore, but in any program. You can control click a bunch of things to select things that aren't next to each other. So if I select this and press control V, it's still selected. So now I need to click outside it and then control V control click V, click outside, control click V, click outside, control click V. And apparently somehow I managed to also select that measure number and those measure numbers are popping up again. So you have to be kind of careful about doing this. I think I'm accidentally clicking the, uh, the measure number. So in any case, you can hide whichever time signatures you don't want to see. So that look, you might want to consult some scores in the genre that you're writing to see how they handle those case signatures. But this process of making them taller than usual, and you can make them crazy tall. You could take this one here. I could control click this one and make it, control click it and make it really tall if I want, right? Um, you, you can play around with things like that. So that's something else that you want to do when doing film scores. So um, uh, so I said that I wanted to, um, you know, let us hear some music that would be loud. So only because uh, I want to make the point that in film scoring, its dynamics are hugely important in any music, of course. 
but it plays a special role in film music. So what I'm going to do is think about the beginning of Star Wars. Bam! And, and um, is that you've you've had the the scrolling thing where it goes by and says long time ago in a galaxy far 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 away, etc. Um, then there's a chord, and then there's some other stuff that goes on. That's my memory of how it goes. I'm not going to bother to try to find it on YouTube because then I'll just get a copyright thing going on. So I'm just going to score a big C chord, and then contrast it with other types of things. These big chords you can use in places where there's no dialogue, where there's nothing important in the music, in, in the film going on sound-wise. In other words, where the, where the visual of the film is telling the story, where you don't need to hear the dialogue, where you don't need to hear the door squeaking or what, whatever else is going on, footsteps. You don't need to hear the sounds of the movie. And that's common. That happens in movies. There's places where the sound of the movie itself, there isn't any sound. It's just picture. You know, it might even be a scene of a nature scene and the wind might be blowing and you might not hear the wind in the movie. You just hear the music and the music is telling the story of wind. That's a common thing. So um, this idea that you are fine-tuning your music to what's going on there with the idea that maybe it's actually taking the place of some of the sound. So in any case, I'm going to put in a nice big C chord. And I'm going to do this by making it a... Um, oh, oh, and here's another little trick for you. Um, before I even enter a note, I know that the dynamic straight down the, the board here is going to be double forte. So what I'm going to do is select that whole column and then just go ahead and add that right away. Just go ahead and write in double forte. Boom. So now I've got the double forte on all my staves. That's a really nice thing to be able to do. And now I'll go ahead and write in, um, so I want to enter a whole note. And then I'll go down to the staff below it and I'll make this be an I'm just putting in a fairly generic voicing here. G. So orchestration, learning orchestration technique of figuring out how to um, take a chord and spread its notes out among the different instruments in, in, in an orchestra, that's called orchestration. It's a whole topic in itself. I would say I have some experience in that topic, but I'm not necessarily an expert in it, but I'm doing things here that basically are commonly done. So I'm taking a basically a C chord and splitting its notes up. So I want to be in concert pitch when I do this so that I'm definitely uh, entering the notes I want to end. Enter. And then my bassoons will be uh, a G and a C. My horns, I'm just going to click these things in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the thing is... When you have four horns, a typical thing is uh, one and three are on the top staff, two and four are on the bottom staff. And there's historical reasons for this, where basically some players specialize in playing high notes, other players specialize in playing low notes. They might have different mouthpieces and everything. And so often we double the horns. So in fact, if I want this to sound bigger, here's a little trick for you, a musical trick. Uh, don't actually give the horns four different notes. Give them only two notes. Let the first and third double that. So I'm going to let them double the um, G. And then these ones double the C. For trumpets, I'm going to let them be an E and a C. For the trombones, I'll let it be a G. Whoops. That's why I don't use the mouth normally. For tubas, I'll let it be a, a C down there. For timpani, it'll be a C. And a harp is barely going to contribute because, but it'll be a whole chord. And violins, I will put in also a high C, and then an E, 
I'm making what's called an open voicing, a C, an E. Violas will have a G, and the cellos will have a low C, and the basses will have a low C. Actually, the cellos, because they can hit the C below that, I'll give them the C below that also. All right, here is my beautiful chord. I'm going to save this thing now because I just spent a lot of time setting all that up. And um, we'll save it to my cafe folder, the 2022 folder. All right. Now, Kika, this is why I didn't turn up the volume before. You ready? I hope you were ready. Um, so that actually sounds. <laughs> now, OK, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I feel like um, I want to at least give it a, a, a really quick try. Star Wars opening chord. I want to see. It's basically the same thing. It's not, but it's, you know, it's a similar type of thing. We're going to hear an ad first, right? Sorry about that. Let's see. Hello and welcome to the very first yeah, yeah, episode yeah, yeah. of the John Williams Geek Cantina, where we analyze brief moments from what is he doing there. Essentially, that is just a B flat major chord. Oh, but it's you B can flat. find a B flat many other composers like, like Come on. Ski, Mendelssohn, Mozart, Schumann, and the relatively contemporary William Walton. But oh. how come none of those chords sound like John Williams' Star Wars chord? That's the chord. So, <laughs> B flat though. So let me select it all, and I'm just gonna go. Well, first of all, no, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna transpose it because I, the whole piece is gonna be in B flat. So I'll go to Tools, Transpose, B flat. So, versus John Williams. But how come none of those chords sound like John Williams' Star Wars chord? Yeah, mine sounds kind of similar to it. Sounds more similar to it than the others. The others weren't trying. So, um, anyhow, uh, this idea that you're going to write big chords like that when you want your music to be front and center. But an awful lot of the time in movie scoring, that's not what we're doing. If you're doing what's called an underscore, underscore is the music that happens below the dialogue, because that happens sometimes. Some of the dialogue, there's no music behind it. And then sometimes you're aware of the music starting during the dialogue. That might be a thing you become aware of, and it's like, oh, cue something emotional happening now, right? Um, like, uh, someone does a startled take and then maybe there's some scary music behind them and then the conversation continues, whatever. There's, you know, you want to watch movies and pay attention to how the music fits with it. But in any case, it's common to only to, to want there to be passages where it's, um, quiet behind the, uh, um, behind the dialogue. So then maybe you have passages where it's only the strings instead of the whole orchestra or only the winds or two flutes and a cello or whatever you want it to be. That's all orchestration stuff. But um, I treating sections as sections is sort of the standard, standard, normal thing. Use winds together or brass together or strings together and then, you know, augment it with people from the other sections. That's sort of the stereotypical thing to do. The cool thing to do is find unusual combinations of things. But just saying, hey, we're going to just let the strings play here, nothing wrong with that. By the way, and, the, and we're talking music here, not necessarily muse score, but you know, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all good, right? Um, it's important to know in movie, in movie scoring, you can do things that you wouldn't do in other types of music. And when I say other types of music, imagine a two hour long piece actually being performed start to end. The movie score, that's not going to be the case normally. It's not going to be performed start to end. So that means you can do things that you wouldn't normally get away with, like 
make the brass play the whole way through. That's not normally advisable. It's a, uh, well, first of all, you wouldn't want that in a movie either, really. But what I'm saying is <laughs> the mechanics of playing brass instruments is such that you got to give them a break. You got to let the brass instruments rest. You can't let them just have uh, notes the whole way through. It is not sustainable for brass, um, especially like long notes that you think, oh, I'm just playing quiet, long notes. Quiet, long notes take a lot of air. So um, quiet chords behind uh, dialogue for extended periods, you might think, oh, it'd be really cool to do that for brass. Yeah, it might be. And you could get away with it because they only have to record it in 27 seconds. But in writing concert music, you probably wouldn't do that as much. Strings can carry that stuff better. So anyhow, that's the stereotypes that we have. And sometimes it's nice to work within those stereotypes. So then I might write um, something. Oh, I keep thinking I'm writing in in um, in uh, in uh, C, but I'm not in C. Let's see. How about I, I'm just writing random notes in here so that we can just hear something quiet. And maybe my quiet passage, I let it just be in unison. And so I'll just copy and paste the same passage just for. And maybe that's what's happening behind some dialogue, right? And then you can bring in instruments as you need to. This idea of what's called orchestrated dynamics. Don't think of dynamics as just these letters that you stick below a staff. You're not writing for 20-something instruments. I don't know how many this is exactly, but it's probably about 20-something instruments. One, okay, I want to know now. One, two, three, four, five six. No, I can't count. I, I'll lose track because um, some of the, some of them have two staves and some of them don't and yeah, whatever. Um, but don't think that, you know, you're always writing for 20 something instruments and just using dynamic markings to change the dynamics. No, you absolutely want to change how many instruments you're writing for and what those instruments are. And again, this is generally true of all music, concert music, as well as film music. But for film music, it takes on an additional significance because sometimes the instruments used convey something specific about the scene. Like if we think about Darth Vader's theme music, right? that theme music is identifiably, that's what happens when Darth Vader comes on the screen or Jaws, right? That, that theme happens when the shark appears on the screen and certain instruments to indicate certain things. These things are called, uh, I guess, leitmotif, if I'm pronouncing it right, because I think it's L-E-I-T in German, that's light, right? Leitmotif. Um, I think a lot of people say leitmotif, but I think that's wrong. So um, it's an opera technique of using particular sounds to associate with different characters. But this is, especially in John Williams music, it's big, having particular melodic themes that are associated with particular characters. And when that character appears, we hear their music. Not to like a ridiculous extreme necessarily, but that, that is something that you definitely think about. And so finding ways of then doing that in a way that doesn't sound like a cartoon, like, oh, we just showed Princess Leia. So we're going to show, you know, we're going to play the Princess Leia music now, even though we are just doing something unrelated. Sometimes it's more subtle than that. You work in her melody, which might have originally been strings and flute. But you, because we were just in a, in a passage that was more brass, we let the French horn play that melody or something. So you, sometimes it's about the melody, sometimes it's about the instrumentation. In film music, you want to be really thinking about all these variables and how they connect to the scene itself. So I'm obviously more <laughs> comfortable talking about music than I am talking about all those technical glitch detail things. But just because I'm an absolute glutton for punishment, part of me still wants to try this Jack thing one last time. Um, no, I don't, because it's going to absolutely destroy MuseScore's ability to play you music. And I got to play my music, my MuseScore theme song. So um, someday I'll make a video in which I have all this stuff working and then I can just point you to the video and I'll say, hey, watch that video and that shows you how to set this stuff up. But 
in principle, it was that process that I showed you. You start QJAC controller, which is basically Jack. You start your synthesizer, QSynth, or if you're using digital audio workstation software, Ardor or whatever else, you start that. And then you start MuseScore and XJDO. So those are the things you want. Jack itself, QJAC controller to, to is basically Jack. And then the synthesizer, MuseScore, and the video player. And they're all going to talk to each other. And the bottom line will then be that uh, when you play your music in MuseScore, you'll hear the synthesizer play it, and it will, it will sound basically the same. So that's not very interesting. But the video will play, you know, it, when you hit the play button in MuseScore, it'll play the video. If you jump to measure seven in MuseScore and press play, the video will jump to that spot. So it stays synchronized. That's what all this software that I struggled and struggled and struggled to set up would have done. It would have done it so that I could create my music and say, okay, at this point here in my score, it's going to synchronize with that spot in the video. And then every time I go to that spot in the score, the video will jump there and it'll keep it all synchronized. So that's what those tools will allow you to do. But yeah, you could you could just do it by just sitting here and watching and writing down times. Okay, that happens at, at one minute, 23 seconds in. And then you just plan that in your music. And then you just start the two video, you start the video and the music score playback together and watch them together. You don't need the fancy synchronization to make that happen. So, um, you know, it's it's not absolutely required. But let me just show you one thing about that synchronization then. I'm just going to play my uh, video because then I want to wrap up. But I am going to play my video. So, and I'm not going to use XJDO to do it. I'm just going to play the video. So here's my video. And as I've mentioned, it's not really very interesting. But I want to give you the idea here. So I'm going to play it. Hi, this is me, and I'm just talking to you, and I'm going to pause and just do a slightly different scene here. And here I am from a different angle. This now, is like why is it being all jumpy? I don't maybe know. Maybe we want some different music. So let's look at what just happened there. When I played there, watch the timer here. Hi, this is me, and I'm just talking to you, and I'm going to pause and just do a slightly different scene here. Seven seconds in. Seven seconds in is when the scene changed. If you want to synchronize your music to it, again, XJDO makes that really easy because it will just show you right where what measure that's on. But I can do that too. I can take my puppy through the thing, puppy through the puppy running through the field music, and I can open up the play panel here and watch the play position timer here. So get ready for the loud music. And seven seconds in. Right there. So it was three beats into this measure here. So if I put in something three beats in, and I'll make it be uh, just a loud uh, note. And I'll make it loud again. So I'll start right here. This time, so we don't hear the loud core, but I just want to make sure this happens. So that happened at seven seconds. So now, if I want, I can watch my movie with this. And this is what XJDO would have automated for me. What I want to do is start them both. And I want to start them both as quickly as possible. Uh, and so they're going to be a slightly out of sync because I can't start them exactly together. But it'll be close. Ready? Hi, this is me. I'm just talking to you. And I'm going to pause and just do a slightly different scene here. And here I am from a different angle. So because it took me a second to change there, I couldn't start the two videos exactly together. Um, that got in my way. So how would I cool. solve that problem? Like Let's instead make the big chord happen at seven seconds. So what I'm going to do is insert a measure before it. And I want to make sure that this chord happens seven seconds in. I'm going to give you a quick and dirty way of doing that. I'm going to enter a quarter rest here, delete the rest of this measure, control delete, control delete. So this measure now has only one beat in it and I'm going to add a tempo marking. What's my tempo marking going to be? It's going to be whatever it has to be so that that measure takes seven seconds. 
So if I do my math correctly, I want to divide 60 by 7 and get 9-ish. Uh, so if I, tell, if I say I want 9 beats per minute, then this should be about 7 seconds. So it should take 7 seconds, and then we'll be all disturbed by the big loud chord. So I can put this in here, but I can also give myself a little, you know, a little wiggle room. Um, so I'll start this thing and then start my video. Let me rewind the video and let's try it that way. Hi, this is me and I'm just talking to you and I'm going to... Oops, sorry, now that measures way too uh, slow also. But anyhow, you get the idea. By playing with the tempo markings, you can control the length of these pauses. And and because uh, you're going to have to do that. XJDO doesn't do that for you. But it allows you to say, okay, if I want four seconds of silence, you put in a beat and you put in a tempo marking that achieves it for you. So that's basically have, have to... Uh, um, have to do things. So uh, there's a question about note performer, and basically there's technical and legal issues involved, logistic issues with the licensing and so forth. So instead of note performer, the focus is on a different system that's similar. It's a system that we do have the rights for that we can control and integrate with better. So um, it's that's what has been announced in the MuseScore. If you go to the MuseScore forums and look at the announcement forum, you'll see discussion of this thing called Muse Sampler. That might not be the final name, but it's basically uh, note performer-ish. I, I can't speak to how it compares directly because it's still in the works. It's not developed, but it, it does seem unlikely that Note Performer itself is going to be supported right away. This other thing will be supported um, sooner. So uh, that's, um, that is now what I wanted to, to show. And yeah, sorry, I spent so long attempting to get uh, some synchronization happen that never happened. But Note Performer is basically a, a third party tool that's like a synthesizer thing that it reads all your articulations and things. It tries to make slurs sound like slurs, and it really tries to play with the dynamics of things to make to make things sound more realistic. It's it's a more realistic sound synthesis system. So MuseScore four will have its own more realistic sound synthesis system. Okay, so thanks everyone for bearing with me, and hopefully you found some of that, uh, some of the stuff there towards the end especially useful. But even just hearing about how the synchronization could work gives you an idea of what's there. And I did show you the process, I just couldn't get it to work, but that, I swear, is the process. So, this is what I do every week, and sometimes it's uh, some technical stuff to deal with. And sometimes we just get to talk about simpler things. Next week, I'll talk about simpler things. I'll probably have a, a bit of a basics kind of a thing, event of, you know, some basic things. Um, so uh, check out my online course, the link at the top of the chat. And come join me tomorrow for my music masterclass where I talk more about actually making music. And next week, I'll be back with the cafe again. So thanks a lot, everyone, and see you next time.